Oh, right. I see slides. I see things. I see a very quiet group this morning, more or less. So um, we just go ahead and get started. We've got quite a few things to be able to wander through today. So we've got our standard agenda. We've got some notes coming in from KubeCon. We've got our SIG updates, and we'll be having some presentations from Chubao and Operator Hub. Uh, I am now playing the role today of Liz Rice, who is currently out. So um, yeah, some notes from KubeCon. Wanted to be able to highlight that we had 11,000 attendees here today. And big, big important thing, as Chris has noted over in chat, December 4th, that's the deadline for our Amsterdam pieces coming in. Oh, Chris, anything on that? No, CFP closes tomorrow. Um, and just opening to uh, people to make any comments, thoughts, suggestions on how to improve <coughs> KubeCon uh, next year. So we're kind of open to suggestions here. Um, there's also a survey um, that we ask people to fill out, but we could use a few minutes on this call for some feedback. I'll also be watching chat to see if there's anything in there. And that survey is also linked into these slides. So happy to be able to have people look at those from there. All right, um, we can move on. And yeah, coming up, we've got our, our KubeCons that you've seen. Uh, and for those that are in reInvent, we want to be able to let you know that we do have a night of networking um, details over on the Twitter account, as well as the um, slides here. Please RSVP so we know for coming. All right, yep. Last pieces in here, the Kubernetes forums, they are coming very, very soon. And uh, one note, we do still have India sponsorships available, as well as the opportunity to be able to do co-located days for the India events as well. So um, please reach out if that's something you're interested in. All right, uh, other pieces in here as far as housekeeping. Uh, we have current votes out on the table. Uh, we've got a Falco vote, we've got a SIG network vote and the tough graduation vote. Um, so these are all currently open if you want to be able to add both binding votes from TOC or show us support votes, non-binding votes, please go ahead and drop those into the mailing list. All right. All right. Yeah. So, up, hey, update from SIG app delivery here. Um, first, we had our first two sessions at KubeCon on a, like an introductory session and a detailed session on the app delivery model, which we have been working on. Um, this was very well received. So, the feedback from the community it was very good to have that structured approach, and we got some uh, additional questions around it. Uh, very notably, we also asked the audience what they would be mostly interested um, in learning more about. One key aspect really was here uh, about Kubernetes for air-gapped environments. Also, we got some feedback out of the telecommunication industry. So the main, the main question is basically, how can I run my Kubernetes environment? And which also obviously ties into the whole application packaging topic if I have an environment that has no access to the internet. Uh, tomorrow we will have a presentation from, from Microsoft and uh, from the CNAP folks on best practices there. But this was something that came up uh, several times during KubeCon, how these situations can be handled and what the problems is, which is I think something we should follow up further on and develop a best practice out of, given there was some uh, work there. Operator definition. This is still work in progress. So we uh, we were asked by the TOC to come up with a definition uh, around operators and what we want to do there. This has been started uh, already, uh, but we will have a first discussion tomorrow and then get back to the TOC with, uh, with the work in progress. Uh, on the project evaluation, so we have a couple of evaluations uh, that are pending from SIG app delivery right now. Uh, this is just a friendly reminder that we would like to have some input on evaluation guidance and due diligence documents, which we could use as templates here. 
Um, I think that's where we kind of stuck somehow is what is the ideal format to present this back to the TUC. This is where SIG app delivery is still uh, looking for guidance on how we should best handle this. So everything that the TUC can share with us is, is highly appreciated here. Um, so whether it's also past evaluations, whatever is available. During our KubeCon meeting, um, it was mentioned that there is now a template that has been or is in the process of being uh, created. So please, please share this with us so we can uh, use it also here. Hi, Luis. Uh, from the I got your message. Sorry. Uh, yes, I've been away uh, out of the office for a while, but I'll, I'll send you all of that material that you requested. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was assuming that given the whole uh, Thanksgiving holidays, you might be out. Uh, but expect obviously feedback once you have these documents and can provide more. Just on some projects we have uh, that have been that have presented some feedback here, uh, where we would also ex have a more detailed discussion with the TUC about uh, the Argo project, which is currently under review. Uh, the question here is, uh, or the challenge here is that looking at Argo, you look looking at Argo CD, Argo events, Argo workflow, and those projects, it's actually not a single project submission. It's the submission of um, multiple projects, and also these different projects have also a different maturity and community adoption. So um, this was more than intended, obviously, also because the TUC an open discussion, how to handle uh, situations uh, like this, where somebody not just proposed like a single project, but in a, a bunch of them uh, all together. On the operator framework, uh, this is actually a nice coincidence that we have later on the discussion about the operator hub. There was just a question whether we should split up the operator framework as a project from the operator hub discussion simply because the operator framework obviously is this uh, project to build operators uh, the operator hub is coming with its own infrastructure requirements and a lot more around that the hub itself like whether it's accepting other operators how to handle these things and also the cost obviously of running it but as we have a presentation on operator hub today um, i would defer here for the presentation later on Yeah, as, uh, regarding the comments, the operator in this case is the, the Kubernetes operator, not the person who's operating. And the question on Kudo, I think uh, regarding Kudo, the TUC is already engaging with the Kudo folks. Um, not, and there's no wait right now on the feedback from uh, ZGAP delivery. But that is one of the projects that, that does, does need to go through ZGAP delivery as part of their proposal to the TOC and the Z. CNCF, correct? Uh, yes, it is. It's an app delivery project. Yes, it is. Uh, but we also talked to the TUC, and the TUC also already provided feedback. So the TUC should already have everything that's needed, or that's, uh, and I think they already re engaged with the CUDA project. I'm also going to talk a little bit about that later on when we get to the operator framework. Okay, that's it from uh, CCAP delivery for now. Thank you. All right, I think we can move on to Alex. Hello. Um, so, uh, uh, Six Storage was quite busy at KubeCon. Um, we we had uh, we had a well attended session um, with uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the leads and co chairs were present, um, and it was. Uh, we it was really good to to have a number of um, people after the session to show interest in um, working with us and and contributing both to use cases and some of the white papers that that we're that we're building, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, we there was we also had a co-located um, uh, a co-located event, the Cloud Native Storage Day, which which wasn't technically a SIG storage event, but had a number of um, SIG storage members um, uh, contributing and, and working on this event, which had um, uh, sponsorship from a number of different organizations, but also a lot of um, input from a lot of end users of, of kind of storage um, projects and products. Um, so we're we're kind of now going to potentially discuss seeing if, if this should come under the, the auspices of the of the SIG storage team. Um, um, and maybe help turn it into more of a of, a, of an official CNCF um, um, six storage event, um, but it's it's only the 
most earliest of those discussions. So we, we need to discuss this on, on our next call. Um, and finally, uh, thanks to Amy and, and some of the marketing guys at the CNCF, we now have a, a, a logo, which we're probably more excited about than we should be, but it is kind of cool. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Um, so I've put a list of um, work in progress uh, that we've been working on over the last couple of months and things that we need to uh, close off over the next few months. Um, there is um, an addition, a database addition to the um, landscape white paper. The, the database section in the original landscape white paper was, was descoped due to time. So um, we now have uh, a few people working on that. Um, we're also working on a performance and benchmarking um, white paper, which kind of covers some of the gotchas, but also defines the terminology and also um, some of the tools that you can use to, to benchmark and, um, uh, and, and test performance for, for things like volumes and uh, databases. Um, and we've also started putting together um, a storage use case library, which, which basically pulls on um, the information that we had put together in the original um, uh, white paper, the landscape white paper, um, and kind of covers um, uh, the ideas. We're going to build a library of, of examples of sort of best practices for, for different use cases. Um, and also during KubeCon, we, um, we had a good discussion um, between some members of the TOC and the SIG members um, discussing some of the um, uh, processes and, and workflows. So, so I've put in a link for some of the discussions we've been having in the in the in the SIG, you know, source SIG, and we'll be looking to integrate that into a document that Liz is putting together. Um, next slide. Um, we, I, I noticed you're also having the uh, Chu Hour of S. Um, uh, presentation later on. So I put this in just for informational purposes. It's it's the details of the the SIG review of the of the ChimerFS project which we did um, uh, in the summer um, and some of the uh, information will be gathered. So we're we're sort of as a SIG we're happy to move forward with that. Um, and hopefully that information is, is useful for the for the TOC and their voting. And that's it for SIG storage. Hello, this is Sarah from SIG Security. Um, we have the, the kind of the main activity that we've been doing over the last few months is um, organizing ourselves so that uh, the growth in our membership doesn't take all of our attention. And I wanted to highlight the roles that uh, members have been taking on. We have meeting facilitators, project leads, and new security reviewers. And so you can check out that link if you want to see how we're um, helping the group self-organize. Uh, one of the outcomes of, of uh, the in toto security assessment, which was um, our first assessment, is uh, the supply chain security um, compromise catalog. So there's a PR that um, where in toto Santiago Torres, the lead of the in toto project, has contributed their collection of supply chain compromises. And then the next step, <clears throat> we already have a PR out for. Um, categorizing them. We want to learn from these and, and help educate ourselves and the community about the threat, the different classes of threats of supply chain compromises. Um, we also had swag. We, um, everybody, uh, our group also is very excited about our logo. We have a, a raccoon secret agent, um, um, a spirit animal for SIG security. So um, Amy, thank you for putting together stickers, which were available to the um, members and people interested in um, in SIG security. And then we decided to bestow hoodies on the members who had taken on roles. So um, so that's uh, Brendan Lum and myself um, before the intro session, sporting our hoodies. Next slide. Um, so we had Cloud Native Security Day, which was sold out with 175 people. We had um, lots of uh, contributed talks with um, the 
board there was a open spaces session, which allowed for a lot of um, discussion. And we got a lot of positive feedback about the interaction between the people who were attending that. Um, we had an intro session and a deep dive. And um, you can see in the bottom right um, that a lot of the active members and new members got together for a dinner social. Next slide. Um, wanted to highlight a recent um, thing that we've done, which it, which was in preparation for KubeCon, where we added um, templates for issues. And this was, um, we had some of them already, but particularly we added a uh, presentation template. So this allows anyone to contribute an issue that automatically gets tagged. And this really helps streamline um, setting up. Uh, Cloud Custodian is going to come present to us on December 11th. And I also wanted to announce that December 4th, tomorrow, um, Melanie Riesnick, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from Radical, Radically Open Security will be giving a talk to the group. Um, and Radically Open Security is a not-for-profit computer security consultancy that recently did um, uh, open source audit of Mozilla through their MOSS program. And so they're gonna talk to us about how they do open security. Um, so we're really excited to have um, Melanie Wee back there. And um, anybody is welcome to come attend. 10 a.m. Pacific tomorrow. All right. For SIG Network, we, well, we had a, an intro and a deep dive at the same time at KubeCon. Um, you know, as part of that, um, Ken and, and Matt and, and myself were present to help introduce the, the mission and goals of the SIG um, and provide clarification around that. Um, for my part, I was rather, well, both. <laughs> Uh, had some anxiety invoked, I think, and but also encouraged that there was um, a full room of people interested in the set of topics that that are stated inside of the charter. Um, for my part, it was particularly heartwarming to hear um, some network engineers or some non-developers raising their hands, um, actively interested in, in um, the topics at hand, and wanting to ensure that they were. That, that, that they should be participating, that it was going to be, that the set of discussions were going to be um, inclusive of non-developers, if you will. Um, us network engineers are developers now, Lee, come on. Yeah, yeah that's right. Be nice to us, man. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> just, take, just take some Python, that's what you just said. Uh, so, so on that, um, uh, there was an article uh, written up by, by Sean Michael Kerner that Kerner that was appreciated that describes um, the, some of the discussions there. Um, I think both, um, you know, given reInvent this week uh, and the pending final binding vote for the SIG, um, our upcoming first Thursday of the month uh, meeting will probably be postponed this week, uh, pending those, those two items. Uh, Ken and Matt, any, anything that I, I missed from our discussions at, at KubeCon. No, sounds good to me. I was, I was just going to add that there was definitely a lot of interest um, in the SIG, and so I was I was really encouraged to see that as well as you, Lee. So I think it's a good sign that you know the CNCF is moving in the right path by by making this a SIG, and there's going to be a lot of there are a lot of non like network only type of questions being asked, like how to how do we kind of integrate this with the experience of, of cloud native? And so I think it's definitely the right timing and a lot of interest. So it was good to see that. Thanks for, um, for putting it on Matt and, and Lee. We can move on to presentations with uh, Jumbo. Go on in. Hello, everyone. Um, this Hello. is Wayne. Hi. Yeah, today I want to present uh, TrueBarFS. Um, TrueBarFS is a, is a distributed file system designed for cloud native applications. It targets uh, containerized and stateful services who need persistent and uh, reliable storage that can be accessible like a local file system. 
it's, uh, uh, it's production ready, which means that it is already being used to support more than 160 um, application services running on JD's uh, Kubernetes platform. Yeah, um, TrueFS has several kind of key features that we think that, it, that, that are important for, uh, to support cloud native applications. The first one is the high performance. We, we try to optimize those five operations whenever possible to provide a user experience like uh, operating those uh, like uh, uh, local file systems. Um, it supports um, multi-tenancy, which means that uh, different application services can share the same underlying storage infrastructure. Um, it's, uh, it has um, a general purpose storage engine, which can be used to store both large and small files. And it also supports like different file access patterns, such as uh, sequential and random accesses. The file system itself is, is highly scalable because it, we employed a separate metadata cluster to store the file metadata. Um, it provides POSIX compliant APIs, which comply with POSIX semantics. Um, by the end of uh, December, um, we expect to release the S3 compliant APIs as well, which is another big feature for us. Next. Yeah, so here is a, is a general architecture of, of the file system. On the upper portion is, is the container platform. Uh, the different colors uh, represent uh, different uh, application services running on the container platform. The lower portion is the shared online storage infrastructure, which has like three components, the data subsystem, the metadata subsystem, and the resource manager. The, the data subsystem is the place where the file contents uh, can be stored. The metadata subsystem is the place where the, the file metadata can be stored. And we have a, a resource manager to, to, to manage the resources and perform the orchestration. So uh, currently, TrueFS supports the Kubernetes CSI driver v1.0. We, we have a, a separate repo for it. We also provide a Docker Compose to create and start the, the subsystems and the, the, the resource manager with a, with a single command. Um, that is uh, that is the easy easiest way to to try the the, the TrueFS on a laptop. Um, we also provided the integration with Helm recently on our release v1.4, um, also in a separate repo. So here is a is a brief history of uh, of uh, the project. We we launched the project on on January 2017. And uh, open source uh, opposed this project on March 2019. We uh, three months later we we did a, a presentation uh, to uh, Story C um, on June 12th of this year. And uh, short after that, we got our first external user Rekanova. Um On July 4th, we we present our industry paper on Sigma 2019, and. Uh, uh, right after that, we got uh, we got our first maintain outside JD. On the middle of August, we we released our support to set a driver v1.0, and uh, two weeks later, we we submit our proposal to uh, CSF sandbox. Uh, just recently, we released uh, the support to uh, Helm two and three. So so the project itself uh, sits on the GitHub under the uh, Apache two thousand zero license. It received more than a little bit more than 400 GitHub stars. It has like uh, 77 GitHub folks, and we we currently have 14 maintainers from three different companies. So, so um, next, I want to talk about the production adapters. So, how TrueFS has been used in JD. Um, the first example, the first use case I want to talk about is the machine learning area. So in JD, we have our uh, uh, in-house machine learning platform. Um, in, on this platform, the data I use to store um, just on the local disk. But as our business grows, um, we got a lot of like uh, training data, and the, the training data, the size is is always is mostly like like uh, on the TV level, and the the container of data keeps changing. So this is the use case that uh, where about FS can be a good fit because it provides those uh, POSIX APIs. So the migration from the local solutions to Trubafs can just require minimum, minimum engineering efforts. 
And uh, on the other hand, because of this kind of migration, we we eliminate those the 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 the, the short, uh, how can I say the limitations of the the local disk space. So another example is uh, is the MySQL database backup. So on the official um, MySQL document, when doing the backup, up, it usually requires an OSS SDK or REST APIs. But this kind of increasing the operation cost for us. And the backup files are processed by multiple layers of services, which kind of hurts the performance. If the backup fails, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, trouble some to, to, to do the troubleshooting to do the debugging. So, so this is another use case um, that's, that, that we, we switch to, to, to TripleFS, because by doing so, we firstly, we, we just uh, backup the files like we're doing on the local disk. We can turn on the, the page cache and write cache to, to greatly improve the performance. And by, by checking those log files provided by TripleFS, we can easily check if anything failed and doing, doing the, the troubleshooting. So there are more like, like use cases than, than just the, the two that I just mentioned. We can find it online from, uh, from our documents. Next. Um, currently, TripleFS has two external users. The first one is the Rapanova. Um, it's an AI company in China that provides visual perception solutions. Their user case is more like a, uh, uh, using uh, TripleFS to store those uh, large number of small image files. Another is Function in Chai, which is an e-commerce vendor of industrial supplies. Uh, there are two use cases for them. Uh, one is the Nginx log storage for, for s cause settlement. And the other one is the product image storage similar to Reconova. Next, please. So um, I want to, then I want to talk about the, the scope uh, of TripleFS, the alternatives, and as well as how it compares to, uh, to existing uh, sensor projects. Um, the one of the uh, from, from the distributed file system area, so one of the famous one um, is the Google File System and uh, its successors, the, the classes, which is Google's in-house solution working together with Borg. From the pub public cloud side, we have uh, AWS EFS and many others. We also have um, a SelfFS, a GlassFS, um, those kind of uh, popular open source storage, storage solutions. We have a very comprehensive comparison from the performance and scalability side um, with, with, with those uh, open source solutions in our uh, paper. Next. So um, how TripleFS relates to other um, CINCEF projects? The first one is, uh, the most important is Kubernetes because we use uh, TripleFS to support our container platform in, internally in JD at an extremely large scale. Um, we also released um, the Helm support uh, as the patch manager. We use the Prometheus as the default monitoring system uh, in the file system. And in the future, we plan to, 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 to integrate with Rook as our storage orchestrator uh, for, for Kubernetes. Next. So here is a list of the, the current uh, CSF storage projects. Uh, we have ETCD, OpenEBS, Rook, TypeTV, uh, Vitas, and Long Home, the new member of the Sandbox. Um, as you can see, there's still a missing piece of, uh, of the distributed file system there. And we think that, uh, that's why we think that a TripleFS can be, can be a good candidate. So um, we actually present, we did a more technical presentation to the story SIG on June 12th of this year. Um, there are lots of like, discussions and feedbacks um, during the presentation. But at this, at this point, there's no outstanding questions related to the project. But besides also like technical questions and feedbacks, there are two feedbacks, variable feedbacks that we want to bring out to the table. The first one is, um, is the, the scope of the 2FS. So the 2FS is, uh, is, is designed to, uh, for, the, for the services and applications where most of the rights are sequential. So although we support the, the random rights, um, but in, in our case, in our use case, in, internally in JD, most of the cases are still like sequential. And uh, the file system itself is now designed for the case where restrict, ma restricted metadata consistency and atomicity are required, such as direct I.O., which means that uh, the, the, the user just bypass those OS level caches and just talk directly to, to the file system itself. Uh, this kind of hurts the performance and it's not recommend, recommended. 
The second thing we want to bring up is uh, is the excess integration being 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 asked during the during the presentation. Um, the the CSI, CSI integration needs to be up to date. So so with all those suggestions and feedbacks, we remove the CSI command old components and we create a, loop, uh, a, a separate repo for it for the for the for the updates of the uh, CSI driver. We also submit our PR PR to the to 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 the community for for the reviews. Next. So um the 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 last slide I want to talk about why is why why CNCF sandbox. So there are three reasons. Um, the first one is the neutral home. Uh, clear, we, we will get uh, by, by entering the sandbox. We will have a, a, a clear like governance, and it's it's a it's a safe place to explore those uh, collaborations with 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 others. And the second second reason is the alignment with uh, with the CNCF mission. Um, based on our company's strategy, we, we want to get a better public visibility. We want to make a cloud native computing ubiquitous. The, the last reason is the, is, is the, the project itself. The TripFS project has a strong relationship with, with other sensor projects because JD is Kubernetes ecosystem in production. So we, we, as an end user, we have the experience of, um, of uh, uh, the file system itself and how to put it into production and what kind of like requirements uh, needs to be needs to look be look like um, in order to support those cloud native applications. I think that's another like strong point for us to join the sandbox project. And uh, yeah, that's it. Next. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right, any questions? All right, we can move on. All right, hi everyone. Um, we're gonna talk about the operator framework today. Um, I know that we specifically had mentioned operator hub earlier. Um, it's kind of uh, bundled in its current uh, format. So I'm gonna talk about all of them. Um, I'm Rob Sumsky. Um, I come uh, from CoreOS, was one of the very early employees there. Um, so I'm pre presenting on behalf of Red Hat, but really we built this uh, community for several years now, uh, starting with CoreOS. So the operator framework is really about a gap that we see in the Kube ecosystem around the next wave of running applications, these you know, really advanced distributed systems that um, need active care and lifecycle management. Um, this is why we bootstrap this operator concept um, and it's been proliferating um, all over, which is great. Next. Um, so we really see a, a gap in building these things, uh, running them, as well as discovering capabilities about them. Um, and the framework has a number of projects, uh, sub-projects to address these needs. You can all find them on GitHub. Um, probably heard of most of these. Um, so, and I'll mention that these slides I'm gonna go through really quickly. I mostly wanna have a discussion today, but they're included, so if you wanna reference them later on. Next. So quick history of the concept. Um, we invented this pretty early in the Kube ecosystem in 2016 um, with a few uh, bootstrapped operators from CoreOS. Next, and then we um, rapidly progressed into a ton of operator um, community building um, along with uh, Red Hat and others um, that are unlocking um, kind of stateful workloads on Kubernetes. Um, we have an operator SIG started under the OpenShift Commons uh, banner and would love to bring that into the CNCF. Um, we're also involved in a lot of the add-on um, discussions for um, Kubernetes and various SIGs, uh, cluster lifecycle, I think that's since migrated to a different um, SIG. Um, so we're, we're kind of discussing things all over the place. Next. Um, and then most recently, uh, we made a big launch with operatorhub.io. Um, this is a place to discover these operators, um, most importantly, addressing a gap where it's not just popularity, but it's um, what are the capabilities of these, how mature are these operators, uh, and what exactly do they bring to the table? Um, you know, some of them are gonna vary in maturity, and that's really important for production workloads. Um, and where we are today is we've got a ton of mindshare and adoption. Um, you know, I've got a stats slide, but you know, we've got a thousand plus forks of our SDK, so folks are using our tools to build these operators. Um, we have a number of commercial products that are delivered via operator. Um, a number of CNCF uh, open source projects that are delivered via operator. Um, and this is kind of seen as the way to bring this next generation of workloads onto Kubernetes. Next. Um, I mentioned this just because I know there was some talk in chat of the definition of an operator. This is kind of our definition 
Um, and uh, we'd like to continue to see that evolving over time and we'll work with that SIG. Um, but it's really embracing Kubernetes extensions um, in a domain specific way. Um, that domain specific way is really the gap that we see um, you know, every database is different, every application is different, and the experts can bake that knowledge into an operator. Next. So uh, why use the operator framework? We've really broken this down into a number of different personas. Um, we think that are all equally important. Um, we've got developers that are um, want to build an operator and, you know, don't want to do all this repetitive scaffolding. Um, we can do all that for you, and bake in some best practices. Um, you've got um, facilities for cluster admins to control which operators can be installed on clusters. Um, you know, operators have fairly high uh, permissions depending on what they're doing. That's why they're so powerful, but there need to be some guardrails in place um, or else, you know, uh, your cluster can run amok. Um, and we think, you know, production use cases really need those guardrails. Um, and then you've got the users of your clusters, why we're all here, why we're providing uh, Kubernetes out to our end users. Um, they need a cohesive set of tools to discover what services are on those clusters. If they want to wire a uh, front end to a um, caching layer to a database, um, all powered by operators, um, knowing how to do that is really important to our life cycle. Next. Um, so the um, main tools that we have for building these operators, we think it's really important to address the entire um, spectrum of skills that folks have and we want to meet them in their model of the world. Um, so to do that, we have um, kind of a, a no code operator, if you will, which is um, building a Helm chart into an operator. And this is a way to get um, kind of the human out of the loop and have a programmatic cube native interface to Helm without using a CLI. Uh, we have Ansible tools. So if you're more of an operations focused team and you, um, you know, know how to write Ansible or have an existing um, investment in Ansible playbooks, you can build those into an operator and, and do a whole ton of different really cool things. Um, and then we've got our Go SDK, which builds on uh, Cube Builder and some other CNCF projects. Um, and that's really the power uh, that you get from all of uh, Client Go and all that associated tooling. Um, and all four, uh, all three of these uh, uh, feed into a testing framework, which we think is really important. This is another gap that we have where we need to up-level these operators so that they are um, trusted by the community. And we think testing and validation is really key to that. And so we've got that built into our SDK as well. Next. Um, next pillar of our uh, framework is the lifecycle manager. Uh, this is a huge gap that we see in the ecosystem so far, which is, um, you know, not just installing an operator, but managing it over time. Um, you know, CRDs are cluster wide currently. And so you need to uh, not have conflict with those. And if you have um, operators that are dependent on other CRDs being installed on the cluster, um, the lifecycle manager has a, a ton of dependency tooling um, involved to get that done. So if you install like what we call, you know, like a top level operator that might install, you know, the front end, the caching layer and the database, for example, all in one go um, and we'll map those dependencies down. Uh, we think this is really key for having a really wide ecosystem of operators that uh, work together and talk together. Next. Um, and lastly, I mentioned this earlier, we've got operatorhub.io. Um, this uh, goes more um, past kind of just popularity into actually looking at those dependencies that we were talking about, looking at the maturity and the capability model that we have that I shared in chat earlier. Um, it's a recognition that um, we want these operators to be trusted. And you know, when they're running your storage and your production databases, um, in your important e-commerce applications, um, they need to be really bulletproof. And so um, Operator Hub has some automated testing as well as some uh, PR-based review process to ensure quality. Um, and we think that's really, really important and that's a gap that we don't see um, addressed anywhere today in the ecosystem. Next. Um, here's some stats uh, really quick. Like I said, the 10,000 SDK clones, I think, you know, shows that a ton of people are using this. Um, we've got, you know, 600 uh, folks on our SIG mailing list. Um, and so that, that shows you that there's a, a gap in knowledge here. And so we've got a community that's built up uh, sharing best practices, um, talking about the next operator frameworks that we want for like a Java SDK, for example. So we've got a ton of engagement there. Um, we've got 207 combined uh, contributors to all of our sub projects um, and a ton of different unique organizations contributing as well. So we think this is a really vibrant, um, healthy ecosystem. Next. Uh, here's just a quick sampling of tweets. Um, you know, these come in all the time, but folks are seeing that the SDK is a really easy way to jump into this. 
Um, and then uh, other projects um, that come afterwards, like the Lifecycle Manager and Operator Hub, speak against uh, you know, the different steps that you're gonna have after you start building an operator. Um, and so we've got folks, like I said, building commercial products. Um, we've got really healthy open source ecosystems using these as well as um, just you know, regular end users building prototypes and things like that. Next. Um, I think the most powerful uh, kind of endorsement of an operator that we've seen um, is you know, a handful of these quotes. I just pulled off one of them from uh, KubeCon EU earlier this year. Basically, if you're going to run you know, a complex uh, distributed system, in this case, like a, a staple storage, um, the advice is really you have to build an operator to do this. Um, you need something actively looking after something, rebalancing data, reacting to monitoring alerts, um, doing anomaly detection. Um, these are things that kind of live at one level above where um, our cube resources are today. You know, a staple set isn't going to get you all the way there. Um, and so we think this is, that's the huge gap that operators uh, fulfill in our ecosystem. Next. Uh, so here's a bunch of our NASCAR logo slide. Um, a bunch of these are CNCF projects as well as open source communities, um, commercial entities. We've got uh, the logos on the bottom of this slide are um, companies that are building internal operators. Um, these are the ones that at least have publicly talked about that. We know that there's a lot more doing it. Um, and I think that's the power of, you know, they're building internal applications to talk to these um, open source operators um, and really fostering that ecosystem and um, all the interconnections there. And uh, as we build up more and more of this, I think we're gonna see this uh, start to explode even more than it has today. Next. Uh, so this is the meat of it that I really want to talk about. So we've got a lot of overlap um, and engagement on SIG app delivery. Um, I'm not going to walk through all of these, but we're, we're, um, we have a lot of um, things that we can bring to the table to address some of the gaps we see in this ecosystem. Um, and I think we're very well aligned in that regard um, around some of the different things, a lot in the lifecycle manager and the SDK um, that we can bring to the table there. Next. Um, and so I wanted to address some of so we presented to uh, SIG app delivery. I forget when it was about a, a month or two ago. Um, and here's a quick highlight of some of the feedback that we got um, via some emails and the chat during the discussion. Um, unfortunately, we ran out of time in that meeting. So there wasn't a lot of uh, kind of live voice to voice um, chat. But this is a, a summary of some of our PR conversations and stuff um, around community governance. Um, so uh, we got a, a ton of feedback on that. So we uh, have opened some PRs and some docs um, about our community involvement in some of those um, regularly scheduled meetings. Um, it'll, you know, very much uh, looks like any other CNCF project. Um, we got one, a lot of stuff around packaging formats. Like, do we need a new packaging format? Um, basically, our, the short of this is we're not super opinionated under this. Um, you know, there was like, oh, is, is Helm a packaging format? We think uh, the lifecycle manager and some of the, uh, the stuff that's included in that specification go beyond just packaging. It's all about you know, um, reacting in dynam dynamic environments, registering those CRDs and the dependency model, and how do I um, an up valid upgrade pass between operators that are way more powerful than just like you know, the packaging format. So I think um, there's still some discussion to go there, but I think we bring a lot to the table, um, like you know, late binding of operators as they're installed and things like that. Um, Managing CRDs was another topic, um, you know, question, can Helm do this? Um, the, the important part is not just, you know, the um, here's the CRD YAML, go throw it into the cluster. It's the dependency management. It's the recognition that um, these are cluster wide and they need to be, um, you know, it's a privileged operation to install one of those. Um, and so it's, um, it's a really key thing that we think the framework does well in the lifecycle manager that is not addressed uh, currently today. Um, and as of now, I think the Helm 3 community is saying that CRD management is currently out of scope. It doesn't mean it won't be in scope later on. Um, so just wanted to summarize that discussion. You can follow those links for more. Um, and then last, uh, I know there was some mention of Kudo and other SDKs. Um, and uh, so we've been, uh, had a great KubeCon discussion with the Kudo team. I think there's a path forward. It seems like it makes a lot of sense for Kudo to come in under the operator framework as a fourth type of operator. Um, and so I think we've got alignment on both sides uh, for that. So we're really excited about that. Um, like I said, we've been discussing kind of all over the place in uh, different SIGs um, and hope to continue to do that as well. Um, I think that is all that I had um, on uh, this. If you can go to the next slide, I think it would just say questions. Oh, never mind. One more slide. Um, so here's a, a big dis um, list of some of the other CNCF projects that we've got operators for. Um, and uh, things like that. Like I said, we're driving um, stuff with uh, 
Kudo and the Helm uh, folks, I saw Matt has some uh, comments in chat. If you want to just chime in really quick, that would be great. So I think we can start the discussion. Um, that's all the slides I wanted to get through. Matt, uh, what was I wrong oh, uh, on? Okay. The Helm so so um, there's a few things about Helm. Uh, one is with CRD management, and, and this actually gets complicated. I know that the uh, operator lifecycle manager makes a number of assumptions. But as I poke around the Kubernetes community, there is no one way to do CRDs. And so Helm wants to provide a bunch of the features, but the problem has to do with coming up with what are the right ways and the right patterns. And I know the operator lifecycle manager makes a number of assumptions and that shuts out other cases and it becomes a problem of aligning around CRDs. And that's really something that the Kubernetes community needs to do. And so Helm wants to and has certain features around CRD management. In fact, many people do install operators with Helm today uh, and, and CRDs and everything and all. And so I think this is something that the Kubernetes community probably needs to come together around, but it's not the case that Helm doesn't want to. It's the case that Helm isn't trying to shut out certain assumptions and cases. And so we're conservative in what we do with CRDs until we're able to solve for many of the cases out there. And I understand the operator lifecycle manager makes more assumptions, even those beyond what the Kubernetes community is doing right now. And I think that's kind of the difference, but during the Helm 3 lifecycle, we will be adding more CRD features and there are CRD features in Helm to manage it. And people do deploy um, operators with Helm. And, and so that even gets into some of the operator hub stuff. I know there's the testing framework and I think that requires the operator lifecycle manager. Is that right? For um, uh, operator hub? Yes, so it does require the lifecycle manager um, to, like I said, uh, go beyond installation. So it's um, you know upgrading CRDs if they need to be upgraded, providing that path, providing the dependency resolution, that type of thing. But but doesn't that make the operator lifecycle manager a hard dependency on an operator being listed in the operator hub? Uh, so somebody could go maybe write one in Rust and deliver it with a Helm chart, but it couldn't be listed in the operator hub in the current flow because it wouldn't fit with the current testing framework and um, dependencies, is that right? Yeah, today that is correct. Are, are, is there any roadmap around opening it up to operators written and deployed and managed in other methodologies? So the roadmap has um, kind of been contingent on some of these discussions. I think we're very much open to that. Um, and we've got some changes underneath the hood, um, what we call our bundle format, which is a little probably too low level for this discussion, but um, that would open up, you know, being able to package things as Helm charts and coming, uh, coming getting rid of some of those dependencies. Um, but I think it's, it's basically up to you. We kind of want to know what the future is before we commit to that stuff, but we very much are open to collab. Uh, the other thing that I noticed in here, and, and since I've got you, I want to ask about, is if you go back to your slide on the operator lifecycle manager, um, there was, I'm trying to find it myself here, there was talk about subscriptions, if I remember right. One yes. slide back from this? Yes, subscription for your operator. Um, this kind of puts uh, the operators using operator lifecycle manager into kind of a, a SaaS model or a service catalog type model. That works great for things like MySQL as a service or Postgres as a service in a cluster that's kind of added on as a cluster extension. But there are many cases where people are using operators in an entirely different way that is maybe my one bespoke application and it's not a SaaS within a cluster. And the subscription model and those ideas don't fit. How does that fit within the operator lifecycle manager and the operator hub? Yeah, so you can think of the subscription as um, a kind of combination of a, um, some lower level OLM features. And so what you could do is basically just do what I'll call like a one-off install, basically do a manual install of one of these versions and then just, you know, have it be uh, managed and installed and health checked via OLM, but then not actually upgraded or, you know, you don't have that subscription idea. Um, so we can address both of those. It's like, do you want to be high level in the SaaS experience, like you mentioned, or do you want to be lower level and just kind of install this and manage it once? Okay, but most of this is centered on the use of the operator lifecycle manager, right? And, and it's kind of the bridge piece between all the things. Um, I think you could say that. I mean, I think there's a, a huge um, thing before that of, you know, building these operators and building them correctly and all of the, the best practice and knowledge there. But um, OLM is a, is a really big piece of this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, 
appreciate the questions, Matt. I think it's important that, you know, we're completely transparent and that's what we want out of this process. And, um, you know, we definitely want to be able to support, you know, as many formats as we can, but to have a way that we can properly test it as well. So, I mean, hence, that's the reason for the framework. I think you can appreciate that. So, you know, feedback is, is definitely welcomed. Yeah, oh, my, yes, I do. And, and that's question. one of the things we do with Helm charts is we do lots of testing around those things as well. Um, because, you know, I appreciate it because we do that ourselves over on the Helm project. Yeah, my, my big question uh, that we also had during this discussion is because you also want uh, eventually to have uh, CNCF host uh, the operator hub is what the actual cost would be for hosting something like operator hub. Yeah, honestly, the it runs on a OpenShift cluster today, and it's actually a fairly small one. There's not a ton of um, resource requirements there. Um, we've got some, you know, Jenkins jobs that are kicked off. I don't know exactly what the cost of that is today, but I, it's not astronomical by any means. Yeah, it would be great to get this because obviously, eventually, if it's adopted by the CNCF, the CNCF should be able then to run this, uh, the hub as well. And you mentioned it's running on OpenShift, so does it have a hard dependency on OpenShift or would it work on any Kubernetes cluster? Yeah, no hard dependency on OpenShift. It's just, you know, I think it's like, I wanna say it's 20 pods. Um, I think the cluster has like three or five nodes on it, you know, nothing crazy. And so these are all great questions. Where should we capture those given the, differentiation of the the sig versus the tlc can we just add this to the pr and address those accordingly as either um <clears throat> action items that need to be reconciled or future items i'm not sure how we want to the project proposal um github pr would actually be the best perfect and so any follow-up discussion should happen in that pr or Please and thank you okay perfect thank you yeah of course uh, other questions? I oh, know there was plenty in chat. Since there are so many, would it be worthwhile to have a follow-up actual discussion in the SIG rather than just try to barf it all up into this PR? I, I mean, I think we're pretty open to whatever seems like the best avenue for discussion. I, PR seems easy. No, but <laughs> all right, we'll follow up there. All right, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, that wraps up our agenda, and we have four minutes to go today. Any more questions? Anything else that people want to be able to surface in this meeting? Nope. I just want to add some um, SIG yes, runtime. Uh, yes. I think we decided two odd weeks ago that we were going to put that up for both to the TOC. The charter is done. We have chairs and SIG leads. Uh, I think the PR probably needs to be slightly updated, but uh, should we do that in the next two weeks? Yes. If you can do that, that would be super. Thank you. Uh, I understood you were going to call the vote. Maybe there was a miscommunication. Uh, if you can update the PR, I will be working with the TOC to be able to call the vote. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. I had one little announcement. I just sent a note out to the TOC list. I uh, Brendan did a great flow chart earlier this summer about project process. There's been a lot of questions and confusions about that. So I made a um, barked out version of that, which is uh, PR 321. I sent out on the mailing list, would love some feedback. I'm just, we're trying to scribe what is the intended process. So have no attachment to the boxes and arrows there, just want to help drive it to documentation. All right. Anything else? Okay. Good to see everyone. I will be posting this up on YouTube as soon as I have the recording and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye.